Cynthia Wright Weiner. Cynthia is the assistant director of the Writer's Studio. Her work has appeared in Plowshares, Pushcart 30, The Sun, among others, and she's currently at work on a novel. Welcome, Cynthia. The model's stitched up face was on the cover of every newspaper. Her psycho landlord had hired a pair of sleaze bags to ambush her outside a bar and over the doorman's console to study his copy of the New York. The model was 24, six years older than her, but in the photos she appeared much younger. Her expression astoundingly sweet even after such a gruesome attack. She was from Missouri, which Nina figured had something to do with it. In his photo, the landlord had the eyes of a ferret, a beard like a scrim of dirt. Nina wouldn't have gone two feet with that beard. You knew better when you grew up in the city. She turned her gaze from the newspaper to the lobby mirror. After the model's wholesomeness, her moosed up hair and thick dark eyeliner came as a shock. She aimed for sexy. She was headed to Flanagan's to scout a candidate to please God take her virginity this summer before it became permanent. <laughs> but instead, she looked ready to stomp into the bar and kick over the jukebox. She wiped away half the eyeliner. True, it hadn't been a banner day. First was her mother squatting with the camera in the aisle at Nina's graduation and hollering Nina's name. Then, lightheaded from Nardil or Darvon, losing her balance and falling on her backside. Then, the reception after, her usual malevolent mood compounded by a bruised coccyx when she raged at the bartender for too many ice cubes in her drink and flung one, one at Nina's <coughs> father when he tried to shush her. But at least no goons with razor blades had showed up on the way home. Nina wouldn't walk into Flanagan's with a swarm of stitches in her face, so there was that. And in 80 days, 10 hours, and 28 minutes, she would finally, blessedly, leave for college. Smile, she ordered her reflection. This isn't a lineup. The doorman came back inside from fetching a taxi for a tenant. He gave Nina a wet-lipped smile. Short and slope-shouldered, oily forehead and fat red pimples, He'd escaped some godforsaken country where his father and brother were still locked away in a decrepit government prison. From a distance, his circumstances made her stomach clench, but in person he made the sympathy difficult to sustain. Black stockings very nice against Miss Nina's white, white skin, he said as he eyed her legs. <laughs> She'd scissored the feet off a pair of lace tights to resemble Madonna's. Leggings, she corrected in a sterner voice than she intended, but that didn't stop him from raising his arms as he closed the space between them. She steeled herself with a muscle-stiffening breath. When he reached for her, she thrust her left shoulder forward so they weren't front to front, but sideways. Still, it was a fierce embrace. His hands clutched the back of her shirt and his fingers dug into her spine. She submitted for the usual count of five an unspoken bargain for his not reporting her various transgressions to her parents, like the time she and her friends tossed eggs out the bathroom window and a pissed off casualty called the police. Or more recently, when she came home drunk from Walker Pearson's after a failed attempt to shed her virginity with vomit still caked in her hair. Four, three, two, she counted silently averting her head so as not to inhale garlicky sweat or loneliness cooties before pushing them away. He grinned and tipped his gold braided hat as, as she hurried out the door. Do nothing I don't do, he called, which he said every time she left the building. She tried not to contemplate what that might entail. Outside was a sapphire sky, a moon as round and translucent as an onion. She shook off the doorman's rope and the model's disfigurement and her raging mother, for now safely upstairs in a halcyon fog. She practically galloped down the block. Anticipation prickled her arms and chest. For other times at Flanagan's, she'd gone mute with self-consciousness and spent the night with her head ducked, making towers out of posters and bracelets out of straws. 
but tonight she'd taken one of her mother's Valium's, then down two shots of her father's vodka in case the Valium was stale. <laughs> Hello, first night of the rest of her life. High school graduate, summer intern, nympho in training. During the day, Flanagan's was an ordinary pub, not so different from the scores of others that lined Second Avenue. But at night, it transformed into a scene with throngs of giddy kids who'd known each other forever from boarding school or the Maidstone Club or Fisher's Island. The guys stood with their shoulders thrown back. The girls had stork legs and satin hair. Everyone glowed with crazy good luck and yellow brick road futures. It was thrilling to walk among them, but intimidating too if you lacked the bona fides. Nina had gone to private school, but her father was from Delaware tax lawyer in a small firm, and her mother an ex-librarian from Queens. She bet she was the only one here who'd spent child summers in Rockaway, where the ocean was a cold stew of waste and seaweed, and the morning sand spattered with the blood of late night gang fights. She kept a wary eye out for Walker Pearson as she pushed to the back. He'd gone to Buckley and Groton. This place was his birthright. The few times she'd come here, she was petrified she might bump into him, but either she'd lucked out or else this just wasn't his kind of place. A dozen girls from her senior class sat at a long wood table. They poured sangria from a pitcher while debating its caloric content. Nina had known most of them since first grade, but it was a loose group of shifting alliances, and if none had turned out to be a true blue kindred spirit, at least there had always been somebody to hang out with. Odette squeezed a handful of flesh at her waist. I've got to get rid of this before September. Erica looked sideways at the pitcher. Fruit's got a ton of sugar. Maybe you should get a Roman tab. <laughs> <laughs> I read in 17 that tab has calories, said Meredith, who always gave her own thoughts the credence of written text. Pam, who always gave credence to Meredith, nodded. Who wants to do slim fast with me? Odette raised her butt from her chair and clutched a cheek. If they weren't at a bar, she'd have pulled down her pants to display the flab. None of these girls had Nina's inhibitions. At the drop of a hat, they'd point out a pus-filled pimple or solicit advice about a yeast infection. It was mystifying, considering how otherwise prissy they were. Ribbon headbands, A.A. Milne quotes on their yearbook page. Whereas Nina, Jim Morrison quote, the only one to ride the subway after dark, squirmed at the word cubic, or a nipple, or a fart. Maybe she wasn't prissy, but she was shamefully prudish. No doubt guys could sense this unsexy lack of earthiness, although she had high hopes for the Valium tonight. Abigail <clears throat> reached for the pitcher of sangria. Sugarless gum has five calories. Fingernails are fattening too, said Bronwyn. <laughs> Envelopes, Nina said, the glue you lick to seal them. <laughs> this was her kind of conversation, surprising and useless factoids. She poured herself a glass of sangria and swayed in her seat to the bangle song on the jukebox. She was starting to feel lighter, as if she'd set down the boulder she'd picked up when her mother fell in the aisle at graduation and had been lugging around all day. Tiny, wispy-wristed Cordelia wagged her fingers, charm bracelet jingling. How many calories, she paused, slyly eyeing the table, in semen? <laughs> Whoops of laughter. I heard it's high in protein. Wait, you're supposed to swallow it? <laughs> no, the boulder was still there, weighing Nina down as she recalled Walker in her mouth, jerking like a fish on a hook. What has she been thinking, giving the first blowjob of her life when she was cross-eyed drunk? Even now, two months later, she tasted bile when she thought of it. <coughs> What's the difference between sperm and semen anyway? Abigail asked. Puddle of sepia vomit, Walker's livid eyes, all this graphic talk rendered the memory in brilliant technicolor. Nina flushed. Can't we discuss something more interesting? How about that model whose face got slashed? Meredith shot her a look of amusement. You know, you might be the only girl in history to lose weight giving oral sex. <laughs> a jittery silence fell over the table. 
Nina hadn't confided in anyone besides Odette, since she'd been the one to introduce her to Walker at Martell's that night in April, when he was home from college for spring break. Now Odette turned red, choking back laughter. I'm sorry, she's the only one I told, I swear. They all stared at Nina. Their lips twitched with stifled laughter. Angry breath whistled in her ears, the sound of her mother's harridan fuming. She forced a smile, and with all the mirth she could muster, announced, there's your new diet, Odette, BJ Bolivia. <laughs> Everyone laughed, playground rules, tag, you're it. By 10 o'clock, her friends were drunk, screeching along to the go-go's and slurring suspicions about their teacher's sexual proclivities. Nina screeched and conjectured along, determined to grab onto the collective buzz like the tail of a kite but she was led. She couldn't recapture her earlier optimism about the summer, which now <coughs> stretched out gray as old chewing gum. Clearly, sangria wasn't her drink. Her mouth tasted like moldy lemons and apples gone to rot. Up at the crowded bar, she waved, waved in vain for the bartender's attention. She was surrounded by guys she'd admired for years at parties or in Central Park. Benji Peterson, swimming star who'd once nearly decapitated Nina with a frisbee in Sheep's Meadow, Laird Cleary, pot dealer and Senator's grandson, stupefyingly gorgeous Gardner Reed, legendary for calling Spence with a bomb threat to get the senior girls out of their calculus vinyl. But why bother trying to flirt when insecurity oozed out her pores, her nose and forehead greasy with it? <coughs> Behind her, a voice called for a Heineken. The voice had an edge that sliced through her. You've done enough for one night was the last thing she'd heard that voice say as she tried to pull the puke <coughs> sheets off the bed. Of course, it was June. He'd been away at school. She ducked her head with the hope of going invisible. The sudden motion set off a shower of sparkles in her brain. She was drunker than she'd realized. The crowd surged and Walker stumbled against her. She pretended not to notice, but he leaned around to peer at her face, his pledge <coughs> of apology. The instant he recognized her, his eyes went arctic. Hello, she said, and immediately regretted it. Humiliation made her voice boom, and judging by his wince, the mold he tasted in her mouth had infiltrated her breath. Uh, hello. Walker looked around anywhere but her direction trapped in place by the crowd, nostrils flaring. He had a slender, aristocratic nose. The night they met, she'd been mesmerized by its elegant line. He had to have noticed how her honker got in the way when they kissed. His jaw tightened. He cleared his throat with a haughty ahem. Beside his iciness, she felt like a sweaty mess. She'd hoped never to see him again, but now that he was here, she'd do anything to thaw him out. The model's sweet smile darted into her memory. She stretched her mouth into an approximation. I just want you to know how sorry it's fine. Can I at least pay for the dry cleaning? God, why was she bringing that up? The clotted puddle dripping down his torso to the lavender quilt, stray curds on the coral silk headboard. <laughs> his parents had been away for the weekend, their king-size bed, Nina's genius suggestion. He still wouldn't meet her eyes, not necessary. He reached around her to the bar for his beer. How's your summer going? The plea in her voice was ghastly, but how could she let him just walk away while she stood here on fire? He put up his hand to ward her off and turned to a friend on his other side with some jubilant exclamation. She stood motionless, incinerated, as if she'd gone home with him for the fun of retching on his parents' bed, as if he hadn't seen how plastered she was at Martell's, how she'd gotten lost on the way from the bathroom to the table, inexplicably carried out a stack of menus, tripped into the taxi and landed face down on his khaki-covered knee, and then kissed his pants as if she flung herself there for that purpose. Mr. Manners, Mr. Yale, he'd been perfectly happy to flick his lizard tongue into a drunk girl's mouth 
and squash her boobs in his know-nothing palms. She'd never be this mean to someone for getting sick, especially when they've been trying to do something nice. When her gin and tonic finally came, she bolted it down so fast she sucked in too much air. She swayed lightheaded into the bar and burped, loud as a frog's croak. <laughs> now Walker did look at her. <laughs> he curled his lip and backed away. Did he think she was going to puke right here? Don't worry, she assured him. I only throw up on dicks when they're in my mouth. <laughs> Walker turned and pushed through the crowd. She should have been suffused with pleasure. Hadn't she just vanquished the fucker? So why did she feel foul and spiteful, standing alone at the bar with her sour mouth set in her mother's snarl? Oh, not entirely alone. A shoulder pressed against hers. Gardner Reed, cobalt eyes fixed on her face. His smile so dazzling and so much for her, she went a little woozy. Huh, he said, good to know. <laughs> <laughs>